Okay, we're going to get into the questions. Everything's broken down into a couple sections. Each section covers some sort of a concept. Section one is theory, regulations, things like that. One of the bad things that happens is if I have an a, a, a electrical engineer in a class, they ignore section one because they know all of this. And section one is a section they don't know. And they sort of now predispose themselves to not pass it. So we're going to do this like this. You'll see a question. And then there's an A, B, C, D. One of them is going to be in yellow. If you see this question on the test, the yellow one may not be, the good right one may not be C for that question because they tumble the questions as well and the answers. So don't, don't memorize the A, B, C, D. That won't help you. The big thing is the concepts. Which of the following is a purpose of the amateur radio service as stated in the FCC rules and regulations? Okay, I wanted to make sure I started that. It's advancing the skills in the technical and communication phases of the radio art. We want to have people who are skilled. We want to have people who understand what's going on. It's more than just twisting a knob and punching a button. It's knowing why some of this stuff works. Because quite frankly, when you're out there and things are not working well, or you're in a bad situation, Knowing how they work and why they work may make the difference between you talking to somebody and not talking to them. What agency regulates and enforces the rules for an amateur for the amateur radio service in the United States? The FCC. In the United States, it is the FCC. In France, it's an organization with a name that long that I don't remember. And we're going to talk about the World Organization in a minute. What are the FCC rules regarding the use of the phonetic alphabet for station identification in the amateur radio service? It is encouraged. Note, I did not say it's mandatory. Kilo 3, Hotel Quebec, Italy. That's me. But it's okay if I call myself K3HQI. How many operator primary station license grants may be held by any one person? One. You can only have one license. One license and that's it. Talk a little bit. There is an operator license and there's a primary station license. The license that you get with this test is a operator license and a station license. Both. You will be <coughs> licensed as KC3MAX, maybe, because that's where we're at now. If you're licensed as that, your station has that call sign. You have that call sign. By the way, K3HQI is the call sign I was assigned in 1958. What proof of possession of an FCC issued Operator primary, what is the proof of the possession of an FCC issued operator primary license grant? The control operator's operator primary station license must appear in the FCC ULS consolidated licensee database. Big words. My name, Ralph Brandt, call sign K3HQI is in this big database that the FCC maintains called the ULS, Universal Licensing System. I, first word may be wrong. But you can go in. You go in to FCC license on Google. You type in K3HQI and hit it. My information comes up. The fact that I am there with a valid license is my authority. Now, you should carry a paper license. I do. When it comes, it's a wallet card and a five by seven. I cut out the wallet card, laminated it, put it in my wallet. 
I have it with me. If I wind up somewhere and need to prove, I've got the proof. But if my license is revoked, it's not like PennDOT, I don't have to send the license back, so I've still got it. If you have doubts about somebody showing up, are they a ham? Google the ULS. What is the FCC Part 97 definition of a beacon? Okay, we're going to cover a lot of little concepts, but as we go, th they'll start to come together. FCC Part 97, that's amateur radio. It is a book about a little over an eighth of an inch thick. It's good bedtime reading. It'll put you to sleep. To pass, to become an OO, I had to pass a test on that. So I spent a lot of time reading it. A beacon is an amateur station transmitting communications for the purposes of observing propagation or related experimental activities. We would put up a transmitter here, <coughs> and it, all it would do would go on the air every so often and give its call sign and go off. What we can do is from around, watch that call sign and see where we can get it. Uh, let's say we wanted to test this area to see if it worked. We could put a beacon up here, low power, and then see where we could hear it around. The first Sputnik, does anybody remember it? I do. It was a beacon. All it did was went around the earth and there was a radio transmitter that went off and on. Beep, beep, beep. No intelligence, just I'm here. Scared the you know what out of everybody. What is the FCC part 97 definition of a space station? An amateur station located more than 50 km above the earth's surface. Makes sense. If you take a look at some of those others, you will see. Don't concentrate on the wrong answers, but once in a while it's nice to take a look at one. And sometimes I'll point them out uh, because of it. Okay, this is a little bit of a concept. We're going to be talking about these as we go on. They're called repeaters. What's a repeater do? It repeats. You take a signal in at one frequency and you have a transmitter that goes out at a slightly different frequency. And the idea is that I can take a small transceiver or a bigger one in a bad area because that repeater is usually on the high hill with a good antenna and a good receiver. It can hear me, even though some of the other people around here cannot. But when it goes through its transmitter, it covers the whole area. Uh, we have some really good repeaters in this area. <sighs> Two of them are down around Mount Holly. Uh, there's one up in Pine Grove, not Pine Grove Furnace, but Pine Grove, Pennsylvania, that we can talk to from here. Not with a handheld, but with a, with a mobile or a base station. It covers a phenomenal area. It's on some... 2400 or 2600 foot hill you know but it usually is on a high point connected so that when the receiver gets a signal it turns the transmitter on and rebroadcasts what's coming in gives you phenomenal range and coverage we'll talk a little later though about some of the disadvantages which of the following entities recommends transmit and receive channels and other parameters for auxiliary and repeater stations. It's called the Volunteer Frequency Coordinator, and they're recognized by local amateurs. The one we deal with is in is Eastern Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania, New Jersey, something like that. And they assign frequencies for new repeaters. Why? Somebody has to coordinate. Now, I will say this, I'm not very enamored with that group right now, but uh, that's their job, that's where they're at, and they do it. Who selects a frequency coordinator? Who selects this group? Amateur operators in a local or regional area whose stations are eligible to be repeater or auxiliary stations. In other words, some of us get to vote on that. 
Okay. The frequency coordinators are selected by the locals, the people in the area that they service. Which of the following describes the radio amateur civil emergency service races? Okay. This is a topic that is hot and heated. There are two organizations, one called RACES and the other one called ARIES. And I'm going to show you the difference between the two somewhere here on one of these slides. It is best if you look at those two organizations the same, except for the purposes of these questions. Because they both do pretty much the same thing. The best MCOM groups that I service and work with are the ones where Racy's, Aries, and Skywarn are together. And the best ones, still the best ones, are Racy's and Aries together, even if Skywarn isn't there. Racy's is a radio service using amateur radio frequencies for emergency management or civil defense communications. It's a radio service using amateur stations using amateur operators. Basically, we are using amateur operators, amateur stations, and amateur frequencies to provide emergency and civil defense communications. All right? That's racing. When is willful interference with another amateur radio stations permitted? This is two key question statements or words in here. Willful and interference. You make a mistake and you have the volume turned down on the radio and you key up the mic and you say something. That's it. And you override somebody else. That's interference, right? But is it willful? Not unless you turn the volume down on purpose. Willful interference is what you hear on CB, where two guys are jamming each other. But at no time is that allowed. As a matter of fact, that's one of the ways you can lose your license. Okay? And doggone it, you should. I'm sorry. At no time is that allowed. Let's talk about the ITU and the FCC. Remember I said the FCC governs what we do. Radio waves cross boundaries. There's no curtain you can put up between North Middleton and South Middleton Township to keep the radio waves from going across, okay, even if you wanted to. So somehow what goes on in one has to be coordinated with the other. You can say the same thing about Pennsylvania and Maryland. You could say the same thing about Canada and the United States. They cross the boundaries. Depending on the type of waves, how much they cross. On 40 meters, 20 meters, they cross international boundaries all the time and oceans. So somewhere along the line, we need to get worldwide coordination. This is called the ITU. The International Telecommunications Union, it's United Nations, it's worldwide oversight of radio. And I will be honest with you, my personal opinion, if they abolished the United Nations, we wouldn't miss much except this. This is one of the ones that definitely is providing a good function. We are in region two, there are three regions, we're gonna show a map. The FCC is the United States Oversight in Radio, but there is a quote FCC in almost every other country. They cover their own jurisdiction. But the ITU is more advice and consent than it is orders. I don't know how to explain that another way. We are in Region 2. If you'll see it, you'll see a region there 
This is region one and region three. Region three is on both sides of the map because the map is circular, okay? One of the things that happens is in region two and region three, there are some different rules on what frequencies are allowed to be used, okay? We're gonna talk a little more about that as we get through these next couple questions. What is the International Telecommunications Union, a United Nations agency for information and communication technology issues? It's more than just radio. It's a lot of other things, but the radio portion is one of the large ones. Which amateur state radio stations may make contact with an amateur radio station on the International Space Station using a two meter and 70 centimeter band frequencies? Okay, as we go on, we're gonna be talking more about the two meter band and the 70 centimeter band. The reason they are covered so extensively in the technician test is those are the two primary bands technicians use. Many of our radios are dual, what are called dual band radios. They work on those two frequencies, okay? You can switch back and forth. You don't really even know you switched other than the number on the, on the screen. Any amateur holding a technician or higher class license can talk to the ISS. All you gotta do is catch them when they're passing over and have a schedule with them. Almost every person who has been on the ISS has been an amateur radio operator no matter what country they're from. There is an amateur station on the ISS. Now if you were cooped up in a place with four other people for a year, wouldn't you welcome talking to somebody else even if it was some school kid from Carlisle? And they will occasionally set up skeds with, if you have a school where you can follow them for I think it's 12 or 15 minutes and the kids can ask them questions and I think that's just an awesome thing for these kids to be able to do and we can't get enough schools to, to participate uh, we have some guys here I personally don't do it remember I said amateur radios 100 hobbies well, one of the hobbies portions that I don't do is ISS communication. I just have never done it. Yeah. But uh, I think John J. Manette has done it. So we have a resource here who knows how to do it. And I have a sneak and suspicion that we wouldn't have to hog tie uh, John and drag him out to a school to get him to do that. Biggest problem would be is if he's floating around somewhere in Europe on a, on a vacation. But we have some phenomenal resources in the area. You just have to ask. And one of the resources that, for the rest of you is back there. She's kind of an interface for the government area with the club in the area. And she doesn't know everything. I'll blow your mind on that. But she has access to a lot of people who are very smart and she actually knows more than she'll admit okay so yeah uh, I work with these ECs I pretty well know what they're capable of and uh, I'm losing one of the strongest and best this year Sandy's resigning uh, this is the gal in York County and uh, my understanding is Holly, when she was appointed about a year and a half ago or thereabouts, decided that she wanted to pick Sandy's brain on some things, which was probably a very wise. That was good. Okay. But any amateur holding a technician <coughs> or higher class license, if you had the equipment Tuesday morning or Wednesday when you get your license, if you had the equipment Legally, you could go out and do it. You may not know how, but legally you can. Okay, let's talk about a conceptual picture, conceptual picture of a radio wave. Nobody's ever seen one, by the way. At least not that I know. However, we know that these waves go through some sort of an oscillation. That's how I depict them. 
and they move. They move at 300 million meters per second. That's a number you want to get burned into your mind. A little faster than what they're going across that screen. As they move, they go through this oscillation. The lower example is a higher frequency. If you sit there and count the number of waves going past you, on the bottom and the number on the top, the one on the top is going to have less. That's exactly what your radio sees if you are on the 144 megahertz frequency. You're going to see 144 million of those go past. Now, you're not, but the radio is. If you're on the 450 megahertz band, there's going to be 450 million going past. Just like that. Now, the wavelength, the distance between the peaks, the higher the frequency, the shorter it is. And that's what we're talking about, the 2 meter band and the 70 centimeter band. And as a matter of fact, if you could see them, the relationship between those two is about the relationship between the 2 meter and the 70 centimeter band. It's about 3 to 1. In other words, the 70, 70 centimeters is 0.7 meters, 2.1 meters is three times that, so it's about three to one. There's some good things about being three to one, too. Okay, we're going to be working with this. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. The lower the frequency, the longer. Imagine how long a wave would be for this local radio station here that's on, what, 960? That's almost a 300 meter wavelength. I'll talk about why later. Oh, <laughs> it's later. Okay, wavelength for in meters versus frequency. Wavelength is one cycle of the radio wave. It's from one peak to the next. If we have a frequency in megahertz, and be careful, it is megahertz. We'll be talking about kilohertz later. Megahertz frequency is 300 divided by meters. Band, meters, is 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. Now, most of you took, learned in school that the speed of light was 186,000 miles an hour. It is. In the Mickey Mouse system, it's 300 million meters per second. Mickey Mouse, millimeters. Example, 300 megahertz, I'm sorry, 300 divided by 30 megahertz is the 10 meter band. 300 divided by 30 is 10, 144 to 148 megahertz. Okay, if you divide that, it's going to come out to, I think, 2.06 or 2.09. Unfortunately, these don't always come out exactly right. But if it comes out to 2 point something or 1.96 or something like that, that's the band. That uh, radio station down the road here, on is that still on the air, by the way, 960? Yeah. Okay. It's really 960 kilohertz, which is 0.96 megahertz. Divide, move the decimal point. Okay, let's just assume it's one megahertz, not, not 0.96. One into 300 is how many meters? 300 meters. Okay. Most the ideal antenna for that is one quarter of the wavelength. So that's about 75 meters. How tall is that? What? 250, something like that? 230? Yeah, okay. All right. I usually use a local radio station, that's why. So, okay, which, of the frequency, which frequency is within the six meter amateur band? Okay, if I take six into 300, what do I get? One. Somebody help me out. I have a degree in math. 300 divided by 6. Uh, 
50. 50, okay. So which one's the right answer? 52. Okay, this is one of the questions that might trip you because that stinking 49 is in there. But 49 is technically in the five, the, I'm sorry, the seven meter band. And it's not in the amateur band. So the six meter amateur band is 50 to 54. It's a kind of a memory question, but I mention it because it's one of those that for some reason or another seems to appear on the test with amazing frequency. Which amateur band are you using when your transmitter is transmitting on 146.52? Okay, take 300 divided by 146.52 and see what you come up with. If you have a calculator, do it because this is a good way to get in practice. Uh, just a comment while I'm thinking about it, we do not allow you to use cell phone calculators and so forth in the test, yeah? It'd be somewhere around two, right? Yeah. Because the four, the 146 is near 150, which is half of 300. Yeah, he does them the way I do them. What's, what's close and divide, okay. But if you divide the 146.52 into that, it sticks in my mind that number is like 2.06 or 2.09, something like that, which is in the two meter band. Definitely the 20, the 14, and the 6 are nowhere near close. What is the limitation for emissions on the frequencies between 219 and 220 megahertz? We have a band that we do not use in this area at, almost at all. I don't, I think there's a couple people who use it, but boy, that's it. It sits between 2 and 70 centimeters. It's one and a quarter meters. It's 220 megahertz. We used to have 216 through 222. We now lost a portion of that. That lower portion is only used for fixed digital message forwarding services systems only. It's, it's basically used for digital work. But we still have the upper section of it. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to confess something here. I do not have all of the bands memorized. At my rig, at home, I've got the chart that I look up at if I'm not sure. Okay, because my transmitter will go outside the frequencies that we're allowed to have. Now, my rig that's in the car is programmed for legal frequencies. So I know that those are okay. So I don't have to carry that chart. Well, on which HF bands does a technician class operator have phone privileges? Now, HF is everything from 30 down. We'll be looking at a chart on this later. The 10 meter band, the technician does have phone privileges. The 10 meter band sits next to the old, well, the 27 megahertz citizens band. We are right now at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. You will not get long distance stuff on 10 meters. But over the next few years, we will start up the side of the sunspot cycle. And when we do, <coughs> you will be able to talk halfway around the world with 10 meters. You're only allowed 200 watts, not the full 1500. Technicians are only allowed 200. However, on 10 meters and 6 meters, which is just above it, I talked to Quito, Ecuador during the top of the sunspot cycle back in 59 or 60 with only a few watts. Not, not uh, I'm trying to think what I was using at that time. I'm going to say 15 maybe. My largest transmitter at home on HF is a little over 100 watts, well within the technician limit. And I routinely hit places all over Europe, Eurasia, the United States. I don't have an antenna that targets uh, 
Asia real well. So I've never gone across the Pacific. But a technician can do an awful lot with that. Now, I'll bring a smile. There is a move afoot now to give the technicians some 40, 80, and 50, forget the other one, frequencies, which can do long distance even in the bottom of the sunspot cycle. So we are, the reason for it, by the way, the primary reason is to get the technicians capable of helping in long distance emergency communications. Because right now they can't use those frequencies. And we want that. Uh, well, they can, but it's CW only. Right? Yeah, it's CW only, yes. And, uh, but I will tell you that it is possible to send and receive CW using a computer to send it and receive it. Which of the following VHF, UHF frequency ranges are limited to CW only? In the VHF and UHF ranges, 50 megahertz, 50 is 6 meters. The bottom 100 kilohertz, the bottom, bottom 0.1 megahertz of that band, 50 to 54, is CW only. The bottom 100 of the 2 meter band is CW only. It's to provide a quiet place for CW operators. In the years that I have been on the air, and I was a very active six meter operator for four years of the five, and that was instituted about year two, I have only once ever heard a CW operator on six meters. I haven't heard one or two yet. Uh, I think it was something that was put out there because thought, somebody thought it was a good idea and it wasn't. wasn't. <clears throat> Which of the following is the result of the fact that the amateur radio service is secondary on all or portions of some amateur bands such as portions of the 70 centimeter band? The word secondary means that we are allowed to use the band. However, we must listen before we transmit. And if somebody else is using that frequency, we're not allowed to use it. Okay? So you move to another frequency. The, the 70 centimeter band is awesomely large. US amateurs may find non-amateur stations in those portions and must avoid interfering with them. It's basically the old willful interference. You don't interfere with somebody. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story that will give you some understanding of this. Britain does not have ITU region, whatever it is, one for Britain, does not have portions of the 70 centimeter band open to amateurs. It's commercial. So the Brits build this bomb handling robot. Some British company built a bomb handling robot and the radios are in the middle of the 70 centimeter band and they ship them to the United States. Can you imagine this bomb handling robot getting ready to pick up the bomb? Some ham down the street keys up their transmitter and he goes, ah! Okay, well, all right. Unfortunately, there were more than a couple of those out there operating with bomb squads before somebody found out that's what was going on. My understanding is the person who found it out was somebody who turned the transmitter over and said, oh my gosh, the label said 440 something megahertz. And it took a while to get them uh, refitted. You know, you're taking a risk if you use it. So that's one of the reasons for the coordination. By the way, there is a company now 
that's in big trouble with the FCC for importing radios and selling them. As far as I'm concerned, they're okay for an amateur to use because we have training and stuff to not misuse them. But they're being sold to the general public as you don't need a license to operate it. And the answer is absolutely not true because you could have a GMRS license, a ham license, and be legal to use them on those frequencies, but they violate some of the other rules for the services except amateurs. And they're now under indictment for it. The radio is a UV5R. If you want to have some fun, Google UV5R on uh, Amazon and you'll find out that they're still being sold, or at least they were a couple days ago. Uh, the reason for it is they can cover every frequency from like 136 to 174, which is a big range that has all kinds of services in it, including aircraft, including, aircraft, including uh, some public service, including all kinds of stuff. And there's no nothing to stop you from programming them in there. Now, an amateur picking that up will program it from 144 to 148. And that's it, hopefully. But you get a civilian, and they go out there and, well, I mean, that frequency's open, I don't hear anybody there. So these are popular with hands. That Bofang thing. Yeah, these are the Bofangs. Yeah, they're popular. Uh, but, and, and although the FCC's down on them generally, Legally, we can use them, but legally, they can't bring them into the United States the way they're selling them. They're, they're advertising them illegally. Okay, here's one of those things you can do wrong. There is a line, there are four lines called A, B, C, and D. Line A goes across the United States there's a little section of Pennsylvania up around Erie that it's, it's south of. You're not allowed 70 centimeters, that's the 70 centimeter band, up in that little area. Okay? Uh, I don't usually go up there, so I don't worry about it. But do you? I actually have family that lives right in Olean, New York, near Buffalo, just south of Buffalo, where it looks like it's right in between A and B there. Yeah, we'd have to, the lot there, you can get a better map, by the way, okay? But no, 70 centimeters is illegal there. Now, two meters is okay. It's because Canada uses, whatever the Canada FCC is, has allocated a portion of that for something else. It's probably public service, by the way. I, Unfortunately, there are also a couple of places where there are restrictions west of the Mississippi around government locations. Texas and Arizona's got a couple of them. There's also one down in uh, Maryland. Is it West Virginia, I believe? That it is a radio free zone. There's a radio telescope in the area. And in that area, you are not allowed to. But if you drive into that area, there are big signs up telling you that you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to use Wi-Fi, cell phones, anything in there. Nothing. So it's not just ham radio. But that line is very important if you go up in that area. Likewise, of course, you've got line C uh, if you're going to Alaska. But most of us don't do that. Why should you not set your transmit frequency exactly at the edge of an amateur band or subband? Okay, a subband is a portion of a band. For example, that 50.0 through 50.1 that's CW, that would be referred to as a subband. The 50.1 through 54 is a subband, even though it's most of the band. It's a portion of a band. And it's a portion of a band that has different rules. 
Okay, but why should you not set your transmitter frequency right on the edge? Okay? There are actually three reasons because it says all of these are correct. To allow for the calibration error in the transmitter frequency display. Your transmitter may say 144.000.000. But I will tell you that it's really somewhere between 143.999. Nine nine zero and 144.000010. You can't be spot on. Your equipment is not that good. One part per million is, well, 0.1 part per million is hard to keep within. So 100 megahertz, 0.1 is 10 off one way or the other. Second thing is, a radio wave is not one frequency. It is a group of frequencies that billow out from that center. So if you're operating on 144.000, you will have sidebands, they're called, that go out probably 10 kilohertz each way. I liken it to driving down your property line. If you ride your bicycle down your property line, you're probably not going to anger your neighbor. But if you take your four-wheel drive Jeep and mud down the property line with the center of the Jeep on the property line, what have you just done? How's your neighbor going to handle that? <laughs> what? Depends on your neighbor, okay? And that's the case here. The only problem is there's also a rule that says you're not allowed to do that. And that's what happens if you set your transmitter right on the edge. You're going to be violating your neighbor's frequency and into your own. So you always want to stay with the one wheel with, or with both wheels on your property line. Also, the transmitter will drift. Even if it started out, when you hit the button, spot on, it'll do this. Not very far, but it'll do it. Back and forth, up and down. So all of those are correct. This is why the Bay of Fang UV-5R in the hands of a person who doesn't have a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. And it's why it's illegal. The FCC does not want somebody out there being able to key in frequencies and use them if they don't know what they're doing. Okay? Now, to be legal, that radio would have to be able to be programmed only by a computer. So that typically it would only be programmed by a technician who knows what they're doing. And then they can switch channels. When you finish this class, you will have a good idea of what is legal. Now, if you have a doubt, Holly, these guys that are in here, any of the hams in the area, you give them a phone call, send them an email, and ask a question. They're going to help you out. And they're not going to tell you something that's illegal and get you in trouble. I guarantee you that. There isn't a one of them, even a couple of them I don't like, that would do that. This is what a radio signal looks like. We're talking about the two wheels of the Jeep. You have a black line in the center. That's the frequency your radio is set on. Below and above, you've got these two side bands. Well, that's everywhere but single side bands. On single side band, you only got one or the other. Okay? They extend above and below the center frequency. And the single side band, as I said, has only one side band, either the upper or lower. Don't worry about which one, except for one thing. If you think about it, let's assume that you're working with single side band. Each of the side bands is about three kilohertz. 0.3 meg, 0.03 megs wide. If 
you're lose, using lower sideband and you set your center frequency right on the edge, all of your signal is out. It's like, yeah, one wheels this way. If you're using upper sideband and you're on the lower, all of your signal is in, sort of. You always want to be a little above so that the edge of the rut doesn't doesn't go over the line. And I, you know, I use that analogy because it's about the best one I can come up with. Which of the following HF bands have frequencies available to the technician operator for RTTY, that is radio teletype, and data transmissions? The 10 meter band only. You are allowed to do data and you are allowed to do RTTY. And I will tell you, some of the some of the data transmission modes will get through and nothing else will. I mean, nothing else will. But the 10 meter band allows that. Most of my long distance contacts have been made on a digital mode. Because that digital mode is good enough to, to work when voice will not get through and in some cases and I will get flogged by some of the older hams for this I'm 75 and I talk about the older hams uh, no <laughs> but uh, some of the digital modes will get through when CW will not and up until 15 years ago, I would have said, CW, if CW doesn't get through, nothing will. But some of these digital modes are phenomenal. And they're fun. Uh, you sit there in one of them and you type, sort of like instant messenger, back and forth with the person. Okay? Uh, that's the one I've used probably the most. What is the maximum peak envelope power output for technician class operators using their assigned portions of the HF band? I mentioned this earlier, 200 watts in the HF band. But then, just curious, what, what's your highest transmitter power on HF? 100. You're an extra, right? Right, I talk all over the world. This is exactly what I said a few minutes ago, close to it. 100 watts, I have an old tube set that's about 120, 125, but that isn't that much different. And uh, 100 watts is an awful lot. And uh, you're allowed 200. Uh, a, good, a good 100 watt transmitter right now, if you shop around on a used one, Transceiver, 400, 500 bucks, you can probably find one. Where somebody has upgraded to a $2,000 when they just want to get a few bucks out of it. Except for some specific restrictions, what is the maximum peak envelope power output for a technician class operators using frequencies above 30 megahertz? Below 30? It's 200 watts. Above 30, it's 1,500. What did John spend for that new amplifier of his that he just bought that's 1,500 watts? 3,300, 3,400 bucks? Most likely. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. And it doesn't... Uh, now, yeah, the reason John does this is he bounces signals off the moon. Okay? 